you're in your garden and you see what looks like to be an otherwise healthy plant, but then upon closer inspection, you see something like this, where there's obviously some sort of disease or fungus or something that is attacking that plant. You can see that right there. What you want to do is you want to take a pair, pair of clippers and cut those bits out of the plant. So that fungus or that disease that's there and present will not spread. It's an easy way to rid the plant of something that could be potentially harmful to it. And then the plant can go on and grow. So I thought I'd come out here today and talk about gardening gardens for a little bit and just kind of give you some of my struggles and give you an update. Every year, I've said this before, you're going to deal with different things, pest pressures, different fungus diseases, you know, uh, four-legged pest pressures or insect pest pressures, or and the season's not over yet. This year, I haven't really had a lot of pest pressures, haven't had a lot of disease. Um, I think the biggest challenge so far this year has been water. Usually in the springtime, uh, we get about 50 inches of rain a year, give or take. Maybe probably a little bit more than that. And this year, like in the spring, normally there are usually a couple of times where there's a week of just straight rain. Where you're going to get like five or six inches in a week. Maybe five inches in like two days. Um, I remember one time, there was like five inches in a 12-hour period. We didn't get any of that this spring. Usually, there's a couple of times where you get that week's worth of long rain that by the end of the week, you're just like, please let it stop. You, you've got cabin fever, and you just want to go out and do stuff, and, and it's just, especially on a homestead, everything's a muddy mess. And so, that end of that week, you're just ready for it to stop raining. But that rain, what that does, it brings you, it fills up all your watering tanks, all your, um, all your storage areas for your water. And so... We didn't get any of that this spring. None of it. And we didn't have one experience like that. Usually that happens every year. Instead, we got, oh, we got a thunderstorm here. We got a thunderstorm there. You know, an inch of rain here, an inch of rain there. And our water is, at least in some areas, is severely lacking. That's the challenge that we're facing right now on the homestead. Um, as far as my garden water, I've got over a thousand gallons worth of water stored up for the garden and those tanks are basically full. Um, we have some other storage tanks that are full on the homestead, but as far as our, the tanks that I have for my house, because we're, we're in constant use of those, um, they just didn't get filled up the spring after a winter because winter can sometimes be a dry season. Even though you get snowfall and things like that, you don't get a lot of rain. Usually the rains are spring and fall. In the spring, we just did not get our fill-up. Usually every year we get our fill-up and our tanks are overflowing in the spring. Just didn't happen. So um, that's the issue right now. But it seems like so far for the garden, we're going to have plenty of water for the garden. We're getting ready to go into July and August. And those are usually the months where we struggle the most with dry. Okay, no rain, you know, blazing sun. And thankfully, I have enough water, I think, for my garden to get through those two months. July and August and then September comes around and you start getting rains again going into October um, but that's really the challenge so far this year I have not had any deer problems I haven't had any groundhog problems or you know I have had a couple times where an armadillo has rooted up a couple things but nothing like not, no plants I can just tell he's kind of rooting around in the area but um, and I killed I've killed two so far but I know there's like two or three more out there um, Anyway, that's kind of been our challenge this year for the garden. Let me know in the comments where you are at in your garden. Uh, here's what I got growing right now. I've got tomatoes coming up. They're doing fantastic. I've got peppers coming up. They're going to do fantastic, it looks like. And then I've got um, okra, papalo, um, achicha. I've got um, Mung beans, I did a, did a little snippet on mung beans the other day. Mung beans are a fantastic way to grow something in your garden where you know you can get something out of it. It's almost a guarantee you're going to harvest mung beans. They're like a, they're like the, <laughs> they're like the guaranteed, you know, stupid proof 
plant that you can grow and you're going to get beans and those beans you can sprout easily during the winter time and put those in all kinds of salads or put them in asian food they're a fantastic plant where you can like grow the confidence of your green thumb um we've got uh potatoes that are going to be harvested in those buckets back there and then once those are harvested i'm going to replenish those with new manures and i'm going to plant potatoes again I, I should always be in a constant state of potatoes and then um green beans pinto beans uh, I said okra, um, I got butternut squash that just went in the ground, and um, uh, sorghum. I got sorghum coming up. I, I didn't do my sorghum for the field. Now, I, back, if you remember some, watching some of my videos, I did that video where I tried to grow um, spelt wheat in one of my quarter acre paddocks down there that the sheep kind of hang out in sometimes over the winter, and it just did not come up the way I thought. There was only a couple heads that popped up and people said, oh, you need to give it more time. It'll come. It'll come. I, I was out of time because I wanted to plant sorghum in that paddock. Anyway, the way life was going and just other things happening, I didn't even get the sorghum in. So I did plant sorghum here in the garden in a spot to, just so that I can get seed for next year, get giant seed heads because the sorghum variety that I have produces giant seed heads. And if I can get some seed, I will try to sell a little bit this um, next fall. And that, the seed, it will only be a few seeds, you know, in each packet, but that'll give you enough to plant at least a quarter of acre. Once you grow it the first season, you get all those giant seed heads, that'll be enough for you to plant an entire quarter acre afterwards. So um, I'll try to make that available. Also, um, uh, Clearwater Valley Farms has, I believe, some sorghum that they were including in some of their American Homestead packs. Again, I don't get any kickbacks from them. I'm just promoting them because I love the company. But clearwatervalleyfarms.com, they have a great amount of seeds you can check out. And they do have sorghum, I, I think. If not, check it out anyway. Um, the peach tree. So I'm kind of on the side of the peach tree. Let me see if I can turn the camera around. I don't know if you can see that peach tree. It did not even produce blooms this year. And so I'm, I'm probably going to cut it down. This fall, I will cut it down. And then I will try to in its place plant a number of pear trees pears around here do far so much better than than peaches do peaches are plagued by disease apples are plagued by disease the disease around here is called cedar rust if you have apple trees in the ozarks chances are they're not going to do well because of cedar rust um, so if you've had apple trees in the ozarks and you wonder what's going why is it going it's cedar rust. And if you have cedar trees, which are really eastern junipers, you'll see these orange looking alien things on, on, the, on the cedar trees. That's indication of cedar rust. But you'll see those only on the cedars, which are actually, again, each eastern junipers. They're not really cedars, but people call them cedars. Anyway, um, the peach trees also plagued by disease. You have leaf curl, you have blossom rot, you have all these issues. But famously in the Ozarks, pears do really really well and i get a lot of comments people are like well i don't like pears i don't like the way i don't like the way pears taste okay you know beggars can't be choosers you know you got to grow what it grows well in your region i've had so many examples of people who were old timers from this area and i try to grow one thing and they're like zach you can't grow that here that does not grow well here you know i, I tried to grow corn one time and this, this old timer, he's like, Zach, this isn't Iowa. <laughs> you can you can grow corn here and you can grow some, you know, things, you know, if, if certain varieties maybe do well, but you're never going to do corn on a large scale here because of the soil type. Okay. He's like, what grows well here and has always grown well is sorghum. And that's what turned me on to sorghum and, you know, getting a crop for that and using it for different things. Find out what works well in your area and grow those things. Um, my blackberries were completely decimated over this past last year. The deer just, I don't know, all of a sudden I've never had deer eat down blackberry plants, but I had the thornless variety. And so for some reason the deer discovered them and just ate them to pieces. And so there's a few vines over there, precious few. I'm going to see if I can cultivate them and spread them back again uh, this year. I have a very popular video where I talked about how to populate how to get how to double your blackberries and that's simply by pinching off the ends of the plant and by pinching off the ends of the plant um, that actually helps them grow more shoots and helps you propagate the plant and it just kind of shoots them into overdrive uh, so i'm gonna see if i can do that again this year on the few that i have remaining so one thing i want to talk about uh, i have been experiencing experi experimenting with 
electroculture. And I've been watching a lot of videos on this. And there's a lot of naysayers out there. A lot of people who say this is voodoo science, that it's a bunch of nonsense, and you know, you're in, must, you must be into witchcraft and crystals and voodoo culture and all this. <laughs> electroculture is voodoo culture. Um, let me just say that I have noticed, I have noticed a complete difference when doing this. Now, okay, I, I tried a couple of different methods going back um, in the last couple of years with growing some of my tomatoes and pepper plants. This year, I returned to my metal cages and poles. My my, it's it's um, um, rebar, okay. And the cages are are metal too. They're galvanized metal wire fencing. We'll do another video on this, but let me just say this: I don't think it's the copper. I I have I have experiments going in my garden. Again, we'll do a whole another video on this, where I have the copper electroculture, and I have just my metal tomato cages and rebar. And both are doing phenomenally well, phenomenally well, okay? And so again, we'll do videos on this. I'm experimenting. I have different experiments going on. And so we'll talk about this. I've had, number, I've had a number of videos of YouTubers I've watched and they say, it's not the copper. That, that's kind of, that's kind of voodoo-ish. If you put metal in the ground, it has been scientifically proven for that to for the atmosphere to be able to conduct electricity and bring that energy into the ground. That has been scientifically proven and they list lots of studies. Okay. I don't think the copper is the key. I think metal is the key. Metal that conducts electricity. Now there's some metals that conduct electricity better, but I'm telling you, I got side by side examples right now and they're both doing fantastic compared to the ones that have nothing. The ones that have nothing, they're not doing so well. The ones that are connected to metal and have metal implements right near the plant both doing fantastic so uh anyway we'll do a video on this separate and i'll show you all my examples and go through that and and uh i don't know i'm 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 open to ideas i'm open to trying things new there's lots of things i did this year that did not work out um my whole spelt field did not work out but it was an experiment and so you experiment with things and you try different things and you see what works and you 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 throw it throw it to your target throw it on the wall and see what sticks and you and you pick the things that stick and you keep doing that so i don't grow broccoli here because i've never had a successful broccoli harvest i love broccoli but i can't get it to grow here for some reason i've tried over and over again you know uh tim has grown it in his garden he's grown but he gets small heads and that's what i got i got small i want the big beautiful broccoli heads I have not figured out a way to do that yet. And I've tried different things, you know, early on in the homesteading when we first got here. It just, I could not get it to work. So if you have an idea on how to grow those big, beautiful broccoli heads, leave a comment below. Let me know what I'm doing wrong. There's got to be, you know, we can get broccoli. It's just, it's small, little tiny, small things. And it's just, it's not worth the space. It's a waste of space. I could be growing things that are far more well-producing. You know, that's going to give me more food than these little things like that. You know. Um, yeah. Let me know what your press pressures are. Let me know what your challenges are this year. Are you getting rain? There's a lot of people I'm hearing who have not gotten the rain. Thankfully, we have the storage capacity to be able to get through, I think, what's going to be a dry July and August. But... We, we really missed the rain this spring, but I'd love to hear what you're dealing with right now. What are your challenges? Leave a comment below. If you have lack of water, let me know. Um, if you're having a hard time just getting out in the garden and finding the time to do this, I know gardening is a lot of work. I know gardening is a lot of work, but you got to put in the work. If you're, you're not going to get anything out of it if you don't put in the work. And then let me know if you got any broccoli advice. I'd love to hear that. All right, guys. Hey, check out our merchandise, teespring.com violates community standards i am guilty of being in youtube jail often when i was on facebook i was in facebook jail a lot too but um yeah if you have you know an interest of ever getting out of facebook jail or youtube jail if you're one of these people who find themselves in there all the time then this is the shirt for you you can find it teespring.com links in the description below also our stupid should hurt shirt our best-selling shirt of all time stupid should hurt if we had more hurt in this world there'd be an awful lot less stupid and there's a lot of hurt that needs to be going around that shouldn't be that, are, that isn't but needs to be <laughs> all right guys see you next time in the homestead bye this is grandma grandma survived the great depression 
She survived the Great Depression because her supply chain was local and she knew how to do stuff. Grandma was smart. Grandma told us to make do with what you got. She also said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Homesteading is all about self-reliance and declaring ourselves to be independent from the system. We grow our own food, we raise our own animals, and doing these things help safeguard our families from the unpredictable world that surrounds us. But what about banking? I love being my own power company, but what about being my own bank? Right now, our country is over $30 trillion in debt and rising. The Fed keeps printing money and the Congress won't stop spending money. Staying attached to the modern banking system and their investment vehicles is like putting all of your eggs in one very, very fragile basket. On one side, you have the threat of inflation and your savings value floating away. And the other side is a possible deflationary stock market collapse, just like what happened in the 1930s. Genesis Gold Group is like a basket holding eggs, and these eggs are impossible to break. History shows us that all paper investments have and will return to their intrinsic value eventually. Zero. But gold, silver, and other precious metals have never, ever been worthless. In every collapse throughout history, people have turned back to precious metals to find monetary value. If you have a 401k, an IRA, or a savings account where you're literally watching the purchasing power inflate away, give Genesis Gold Group a call right now, today, this instant. They can develop a strategy for you in the days ahead. I can tell you how I raise sheep, I can tell you how I raise chickens, or the best way to grow tomatoes, or how to hook up a solar panel. But Genesis Gold Group is your best shot at safeguarding your hard-earned savings and investments during this increasingly turbulent time in history. The link and phone number is in the description below or visit their website at genesisgoldgroup.com. And be sure to say you heard about them from an American homestead. Hey guys, did you know you can become a patron of an American homestead? They get access to private videos and we send them gifts from the homestead that we make here on the homestead. And we also enter our patrons into special giveaways that are only available to them. And before you go, please check out these other great videos. Go ahead, click. Oh wait.